Hello, Dr. Gerard. My name is Dan Sherry. This is my submission for task two, the video assignment for class. Um, firstly, just a really quick observation about constructivism and uh, ICT, the internet, how the brain works. If we go back to our earlier lectures, we, we learned on how the brain is structured, the, the neurons, the interconnected nature, and I guess the highlighted information that then branches off to, to related related stories and related sources. It's very much how the internet um, sources information and how um, a Google search or a Wikipedia or IMDB page works, that interconnectedness and the, the d different things um, branch out to what they're related to. Now if we compare that to a traditional mode of sharing or storing information being a filing cabinet or a library, it's very, very linear. It's very easy to understand um, and it's, it's very, very easy to learn but it's not organic, it's not how our brains work. And I think keeping that in mind, um, it bodes really well for the education of the digital natives, as they're called, um, and this, the integration of these technologies um, once we you know, really get the reins on them and learn how to get the most out of them. So the first tool I'd like to discuss is Google Earth. Google Earth is essentially a digital um, globe or map but it's better because you can move around in real time and then you can zoom in on places and there'll be pop-ups of information, perhaps, you know, even videos, obviously pictures, um, some history. So you can really tie it into a whole range of classes. You can, you, obviously, you've got it there for geography, but history, for example, um, different borders being there for wars. Um, there'll be information you know about that specifically which the kids will be able to see um, tying in for you know art and, and going to different cities and, and seeing the buildings there but being able to put it in a three-dimensional three-dimensional context and I think really telling a story or what um, one of the books that I was reading about on this calls a virtual field trip um, I think it, it the, you know the value in field trips has always been that it's it's a story it's a process where they're they're um, they're completely engaged so all the different the different uh, modes of learning the students who learn in different ways so many of their senses and so many parts of their brain are being engaged that you're maximizing the chance of people getting something out of that and I think Google Earth enables you to do to do that in a lot of subjects I used it myself for a um, a class on climate change and I guess glo global climate would be more specific and I went around the class and, and you, you've got it there and you're showing them this is where the, the ocean current comes up here that's how if this changes it affects this country it affects this part of the world this was a very multicultural classroom so I was able to go around um, draw on you know where's your heritage you know where are you from where are your grandparents from we could we could go have a look see how it's related to the climate and see where the population if, if indeed it was likely to be a place where the population could be displaced from rising sea levels, um, where they might go, what impact that has on other countries, and they could see then how the science relates to things that they knew about. Um, and some of them were indeed refugees, so you're building on that, that story that is their life, I guess, and making it relevant, making the science relevant, and that's where the motivation and this um, self-constructivism of, of education, you've always got to be tying it into that. Um, another uh, tool I'd like to discuss is what I only know are called dictation apps. Essentially, as you speak, they type for you. Now, these are old. These are really some of the earliest software that people came out with. It's just the difference now is they've gotten really good. And you, um, the way I'm imagining a teacher would be able to use this is so you've got your... Um, for example, you've got your, your, your Google, Google Earth up on the screen. Um, you're following your, your presentation Zen guidelines and you're, you're using that to assist with your lecture. But then as you're talking, you've got a, a real-time handout being, being developed, a script for what's being said. Now, that can then go out to the students and essentially what you're going to want them to do is go through and delete like 95, 99% of that, but keep the important terms, keep the things um, that they... Um, are going to use to study and that they personally are going to to remember and they've got it there in chronological order um, they've also got it there written down now that's going to have a huge advantage to the students whose English is their second language they can then go and get a get a translation 
um, or may, maybe just it's a, too much of an articulate word for people at that level, which is a, a mistake I found myself doing relatively um, regularly during my practicum. Um, you've also got really obvious um, advantages to students who are deaf or who are blind. Students who are deaf um, are going to be able to sit in on a regular class. They're going to be able to, to read what the teacher is saying and put it in real time in the context with what's on the screen as opposed to having to have um, you know, a, a, a teacher's aide or someone who can utilise sign language to assist them. And deaf students are going to be able to submit homework in a more traditional method. Sorry, uh, blind students are going to be able to submit homework in a more traditional method. Um, I'm sure currently they have Braille um, keyboards and so forth, but it's really about assisting those students, um, closing that gap and being able to get them to catch up, is that they can um, submit their homework in a similar method to what I'm doing here, except they'll end up with a document that can sim simply be emailed. Um, the final thing that I wanted to discuss was, I guess, uh, kind of what we're doing here is re remote um, teaching. Um, what in some of the books leading that I've researched leading up to this is called tele collaboration or tele mentoring, and I want to speak it spe speak about it specifically in the context of the National Broadband Network, which I guess we'll say that's my third the third tool. Um, the National Broadband Network is obviously a um, it's more of a piece of infrastructure and I got th thinking about it in a different way when I read this book here um, which was actually for the for the, the, the previous um, assignment that I submitted now these Aboriginal communities as most of us know a lot of them are really remote I mean these are, these are places where people go um, once a fortnight or once a month out on a plane to like do their grocery shopping and so forth um, I went to a teach meet at the Independent Education Union and there were some people who had, who had volunteered or who had worked at these places and obviously they just can't get enough teachers and those that they get they can't hang on to. So this kind of um, teaching that we're doing now or that, that, that you've done over the summer class is really, really critical. Um, the, the National Broadband Network going out to those remote communities is what's going to make that possible now. Where, where I think this kind of, this kind of education um, is important to constructivism is social constructivism, which is um, an important part of that. Now, if you're um, in a remote community, you don't have the same ability to put the uh, social... Con you don't have the same opportunities to utilise social constructivism as someone like you in Brisbane or, or me in Sydney does, where it's easy. Um, so not only not only does the National Broadband Network give them give these people access to to teachers, um, once again drawing on people with disabilities could be teachers with a second language, could be teachers who do sign language. Um, it could be you know that tele mentoring thing as well. It could be someone with a, a psychology um, background who can assist students with with depression. Um, and it's really opening up all of that to them, but it's also opening up the um, social constructivism side where they're going to be able to get into contact um, with people um, internationally or perhaps you know um, just in other remote communities and uh, you know how how does this work for you and indeed for teachers in those communities um, how how has this worked in your classroom and really being able to collaborate um, remotely and um, put put that to good use so look I'll um, upload this to YouTube, um, I'll admit it's taken me a few goes to get it succinct enough to, to, to fit into such a short time frame. Um, in terms of the references, I'll just put the, the main ones that I used as, as comments, if I can, I'll have a go. So uh, thank you very much.